Morning, ARC. Well, that's why it's really loud. Well, good morning, ARC. I'm so happy to see you all this morning. I'm so happy to see uh, to have you guys here online as well, who are watching on Facebook or YouTube or something like that. So, mm -hmm. if you could please all stand to your feet. We're going to start this uh, service off with a prayer before we start our first song. Father God, we thank you so much. We praise you for this day. We praise you not only for the sunshine, Lord, but for that rain that we so desperately need for our crops, Lord God. It has been a true blessing. Father God, we pray blessings over this day. I pray that the songs that are sung, the actions that are made, the message that is delivered, all that all it do is glorify you. Because you are so worthy, Father. So, Father, we lift up everything we say and do and sing today. And we say this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to fear. 
so true on that glorious day we will praise you we come to the throne room of grace lord god we are not we are not deserving of such such a gift but through the amazing sacrifice and gracious gift of your son jesus christ you offer us a place at your table place that, Lord God, I know I, had not, I have not earned, but will be I'm eternally great, uh, thankful for. So, Father, I just pray for blessings over the rest of this service, over the rest of this day, and we can only say these things through the awesome name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may all be seated. I, uh, I want to transition us uh, into a time of the giving of our tithes and offerings, and when we do this, uh, I want to stress that if you're a guest with us, you have no obligation to give, but for those of you who do choose to give, know that you're giving a, a just a small portion of what the Lord has been so gracious to provide for us back to Him for His purposes and for, for the kingdom of, of God. And so uh, here in just a moment, the ushers are going to come forth, they're going to pass the plate, Paul's going to sing us a beautiful new song, and uh, we're welcome to sing along with that. Um, but before so, I, I want to just pray over the offering and uh, just, just ask the Lord to bless it. So if you'd pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give back, because you are so good and you give us so much, Lord. And so we just thank you that we have that opportunity to just give a little bit of our life, a little bit of our, of our stability to you, God, because we depend on you. Lord, I pray that, that this offering that's, that's taken up is, is a blessing to the kingdom. It's a blessing to this church and this community, Lord, that you use it to shine your light on the people. You use it for your gospel purposes, Lord. You use it so that many people may see you and, and, and know you and have a relationship with you, God. That's our whole purpose in giving, is so that you may do your work, that you may be, be God to people who don't know you yet, Lord. And so for that, we just ask that you bless it. We ask that you bless this church with it. We ask that you bless the community. We ask that you bless anybody and everybody that you see fit, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.
All sufficient merit Shining like the sun A fortune I inherit By no work I have done My righteousness I forfeit At my Savior's cross where all sufficient merit did what I could not. In love he condescended, eternal now in time. A life without a blemish The Maker made to die The law could never save us Our lawlessness had won Until the pure and spotless Lamb had finally come it is done, it is finished, no more debt I owe, paid in full, all sufficient, merit not my own. I lay down my garments, any empty boasts. Good works now all corrupted by sinful hosts. Dressed in my Lord Jesus, a crimson robe made white. No more fear of judgment, His righteousness is mine. It is done, it is finished, no more debt I owe, paid in full, all sufficient, merit not my own. It is done, it is finished, no more debt I owe, paid in full, all sufficient, merit not my own. All sufficient, merit firm in life and death. The joy of my salvation shall be my final breath. And when I stand accepted before the throne of God, I'll gaze upon my Jesus and thank Him for the cross. Yes, I'll thank Him for the cross. It is done, it is finished. No more debt I owe, paid in full, all sufficient, merit not my own. It is done. It is finished, no more debt I owe, paid in full, all sufficient, merit not my own, oh merit not my own, oh merit not my own. Let's pray one more time. Father, those words are so true. They are 
are so true. The law could never save us. Scripture tell, tells us all throughout the Old Testament that our lawlessness had won. And it took your son, the pure and spotless lamb, to wash away our stains, our sins. As the song says, our, crim our crimson robes made white. Father, for such a gift, all we can ever say is thank you. So I say these things only through the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Uh, what a wonderful song. And if you feel particularly blessed by the worship team, let them know that. Uh, remind them that they're a blessing to the church, as well as the team up in the balcony, that they uh, put in a lot of hard work, and they are a blessing to us all. We benefit from them being here. Um, good morning. My name is Thomas, in case you have forgotten who I am, uh, or in case you don't know me. I may be a stranger to you. Um, and today we finish up our Minor Prophets series, um, and then next week, Pastor Troy will kick off our new series. Uh, if you see it in your bulletin, it's called uh, Exiles in Babylon. We'll be walking through uh, some of the early parts of the book of Daniel and seeing some of the parallels between Daniel's plight, being an exile in Babylon, with our plight, being Christians in a post-Christendom world. And so I think it'll be very fruitful. Um, I am very excited for the series to come out. I think uh, Pastor Troy and Paul as well are very excited. But today we, we get one last dabble with the Minor Prophets in uh, the book of Joel. And uh, the book of Joel is kind of interesting, particularly because it's very ambiguous um, to both the author, the time, the context. Uh, we, we really don't have a lot of information as to who Joel is or when he wrote his book, um, who he ministered to in particular. Um, and in and, and all actuality, Joel is kind of funny because it could both be the earliest written minor prophet or the latest written minor prophet, and the jury is really still out. And, you know, we date these things by looking at, uh, who, first of all, what king is he writing under? Maybe it will mention that. Joel does not. Uh, maybe we can see some similarities with uh, theme. Uh, Joel does not have that. His theme is very unique, and sometimes we see it based on uh, the way that he's preaching about the temple, right? Is the temple in operation? Is it destroyed? Is it being rebuilt? In this case, uh, we see a temple in operation, but one that's been in operation for long enough that we don't know if it's the first temple or the second temple. Uh, we also see, we can date our minor prophets by seeing who's the bad guy in the story, right? Is Egypt the bad guy? Is, is, is Babylon the bad guy? Is Assyria the bad guy? And unfortunately, in this book, uh, Edom and Egypt are the bad guy, which were both the bad guys in the 9th century and the 6th century. So when I say that we really have no way to date Joel, it, uh, it is very, very much a struggle. Um, now, I don't think that's really important in the grand scheme of it all. I think it's nice to know, and I think it's easier to understand what he's talking about if we get some historical context, but, but really we don't know. Uh, so Joel was written any time between the 9th and the 6th century, uh, classic scholars put him in the ninth, put him as the earliest. More recent guys like to put him at the, at the latter end of, uh, of the Minor Prophets. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a treat this morning. You guys choose. You guys choose whatever you want. Wherever Joel wants to be, you take him. You say, I, I feel like Joel's an eighth century guy. Go for it. Empower yourselves, okay? Um, Joel's concern is about Judah and Jerusalem, which may be another way we could date it, uh, suggesting that he ministered to Judah, but um, considering that we don't know if this is Judah before or after exile, once again, we have no way to date it. So he is talking about Jerusalem primarily. So when we hear, some, uh, when we hear his, his conversation about the Israelites, know that it is the Israelites in the southern kingdom. Um, or for those of us who dabble in biblical history, the better Israelites, okay? They're the ones who stayed on the right course a little longer than the others. So... Um, Joel is uh, interesting. It's short. It's three chapters. Um, but there's nothing really minor about what Joel has to say. His message is very powerful. It's very forward. And uh, quite frankly, there's some very tough imagery and tough language in it. Um, but we start with the very first bit of language, and that Joel's name literally just means Yahweh is God. 
His name just means that Yahweh is God, which ironically will be one of the more central themes throughout this book is that Joel's prophecy is attempting to remind the Israelites and us as modern readers that God is God. There is no other like him. There is no other that came before or after. That God is God. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's not to be any confusion. That God seeks to make himself known as the one and only and seeks to uh, allow his, his presentation of himself to be the only one that the Israelites may see and know as holy. Um, Joel, he, he makes it clear that this message is to be passed on from generation to generation. So as opposed to the other minor prophets where we may, where we may say, this is how it may relate to you, Joel's saying this message should relate to you. He's saying that this message should be taken and, and preached to your sons and then your grandsons and then your great-grandsons and so on and so forth, that this message is to be one forever and ever and ever. Now, as we get into this message, know that it's kind of a tough one, okay? Joel is... Uh, is, is interesting because his language is not as uh, cheerful and hopeful as the last book, but yet there is some really bright spots that we get to talk about. So, um, and really, Joel kind of reminds me, really all the minor prophets kind of remind me of a, of a story I heard once of a, of a man who went to the doctor, and uh, he said, I'm experiencing pain all over my body. And the doctor said, well, show me where you're hurting. And he says, well, I hurt here, and I hurt here, and I hurt here, and I hurt here. And the doctor said, well, let me, let me, let me look at you. And he comes to find out that uh, the reason that he's hurting here and here and here and everywhere is because his finger is, is broken, right? So the one problem that he didn't think he had was the one that he actually had. And the Israelites during the time of the Minor Prophets, um, oracles, their problem is that everything that they're, that they're attempting to figure out, every problem they're trying to solve is actually not the problem, it's them. They, they want to say, well, I, my, my crop isn't growing, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not go to church so I can spend that extra time in the field. Or my, 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 I'm not going to pray to God because I need to talk to other people about other things. Or I'm not going to listen to God's voice because I need to hear what everybody else is talking about. And before long, they realize that really they're the problem all along. It wasn't that the crops weren't growing or the prayers weren't being uh, answered, or they weren't hearing God's voice, it was that they just really weren't looking for it. They were trying to cut it out, they were trying to cut corners, and so inevitably, their blessing wanes, their country fails, and their people suffer. But the good news is that we preach of a God who is good and just and loving and patient and strives for repentance, it strives for relationships to be rebuilt and restored. And, and when we get into the thick of Joel, remember this, that Joel is actually a story about God motivating his people to come back to him. It's not a story of God being a big meanie or God saying, hey, I don't like the way you do things all the time because you guys are always wrong and whatever. It really, at the end of the day, the story of Joel is, is God saying, I want my people back to me. I want a relationship with them. I want to love them. I want to bless them. So a little bit of context is necessary for the book of Joel. Immediately prior to the book of Joel uh, and, and, and the ministry of Joel, a terrible locust plague uh, terrorizes the southern kingdom of, of Judah. Uh, it destroys all the crops. It totally changes their way of life. And uh, he actually mentions it in chapter 1, verse 4, the kind of destruction that came. He says, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hop hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. The, the, the idea there is that the locust came and they took everything that they had. And, and, and I, I like this story because I, uh, in the South, you know, there's a lot of locusts in Texas, right? And you hear them all summer long. And they're, they're not as particularly bad because there's not a lot of crops in North Texas, but they're very annoying and they're very loud. And I, I, when I think, when I read these stories, I'm like, well, they're just annoying. They're not really dangerous. But in, in reality, locusts are a really, really big issue, um, both in the Middle East and globally. Uh, and I, when I was reading uh, about this book, one of the funny things that kind of came up to me was that locusts typically travel in the Middle East in hordes of 40 to 80 million, okay? It's not like a few locusts or like 10 or 12. We're talking about tens of millions of locusts all at a time visiting a specific area. Now, the thing about a locust is a locust eats its weight in crops in a day, right? So 40 to 80 million locusts could eat about 400 million pounds of plants a day. 
So now we're starting to see a little bit of how this is a big deal, okay? All the farmers in the room are like, no, no, please. Oh, gosh, no. Oh, no, no. Uh, 400 plus million pounds of crop eaten a day in a time where crops were harder to grow became a very big issue very quickly for the Israelites. Now, it wasn't uncommon, but it wasn't necessarily an everyday occurrence that locusts would come. But when they did come, it was essentially a big reset button for Israel. And so Joel's ministry picks up immediately after this with Joel using this plague to foreshadow God's warning of the day of the Lord, which the day of the Lord being an apocalyptic day that's to come in the future where God will judge and the righteous will be blessed and the unrighteous will be cursed, essentially. And that day of the Lord, God says, is coming soon to the Israelites in the book of Joel. He warns them of it. In fact, he, he tells them to immediately repent, and he gives some very vivid imagery of how one is to repent. In, uh, in chapter 1, verse 13, he starts, he says, Put on sackcloth and lament. O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty, it comes. Now, Joel is, he, he offers this word from God, and this is after his description of the destruction, okay? That he talks about, hey, the locusts have come, they've, they've destroyed, they've acted almost like an invading army. They've, they've taken the land, they've destroyed your hope, they've crushed your dreams, they've made you feel totally obliterated, okay? These bugs have done this to you. And he says, but, but this, in the same way that this is happening, know that the day of the Lord, too, will be destructive, will be a day to lament, will be a day to uh, seek repentance and to seek uh, the tearing of your, of, your, of your sackcloth, the tearing of your, uh, of, your, of your life apart. It's a big, big warning from God to his people. And then we move on a little bit. We're, we're t- we continue this little bit of summary in chapter 2 because he talks about it again, okay? He, he issues a, a, a talk of repentance. He says, do this, have a moment where you're in church, where you're with your people, where you gather the others and you sit and you cry together and you think about all the ways that I've failed and you ask God to come and be with me. Chapter 2 then begins with another ominous warning from God to, uh, through Joel to the people about the day of the Lord. And, and this one is even more vivid. The words here are even more... Uh, even more violent, uh, even more descriptive. And really, he's talking about an army now. So at first he talks about locusts, horde, and now he's saying, on the day of the Lord, an actual army will come. He, uh, he talks about this army. He says that uh, fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. He goes on and says that their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. He says they leap on top of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. He says, before them, people are in anguish. Their faces grow pale. He says, they leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. And now we kind of trail off a little bit there, right? He's talking about an army. He says, like, fire, and there's war horses, and there's destruction. Then he says, they're leaping on the walls. He says, they're running up the, uh, up the walls. They're climbing on the houses. They're leaping through the city. And all of a sudden, it doesn't sound like an army anymore, okay? Because... I'm not, I'm not an expert in history, but I've never read, I've never opened a book about uh, World War I and heard of British soldiers leaping through the city, okay, or climbing up the walls, okay. We, war is typically described a little bit differently, and it's because Joel is trying to relate this army to the locusts that came to destroy them beforehand. So in the first chapter, he talks about locusts that act like an army. In the second chapter, he describes an army that's going to behave like locusts, that it infests and invades even the most private parts of their life. The one that can not only destroy, but can usurp their very way of life. And that this army is not just any army, because in, in, in chapter 2, verse 11, this is what God says through Joel. He says, the Lord utters his voice before his army. There's kind of a, a surprise moment here with the ministry of Joel, where Joel, all of a sudden, he's talking about this devastating army that will come on the day of the Lord, and he mentions, he says, oh, by the way, this is God's army that's coming, to destroy the walls, to destroy the towns, to destroy the crops, to be like a flame before and after them. He says, this is actually God's army that's coming. It's not just another army. You've seen other armies. 
you've seen the destruction that other armies can bring. This is actually God's army that's coming. And it will destroy you like you've never been destroyed before. It's kind of alarming. It's kind of the language that we don't always talk about. Uh, it's kind of the language that we don't always have a good time reading about. But here's the thing. And here's the, the first thing that we really have to pay attention to in the book of Joel is that Joel is fighting against his people for some reason, okay? God's not just some bully or bad guy, right? He's fighting against his people for some reason. Now, Joel does something very particular that's unlike the other minor prophets in that he doesn't exactly tell us why God is angry at the Israelites. We, we can read in the book of Hosea or the book of Malachi, or, or we can open up the book of Jonah, or the book of Habakkuk, and we can read all these moments where God is descriptively angry about a very specific thing. He says, your worship is false. He says, you are bowing down to false idols. He says that you, are, you have abandoned your prayer. You have not built, rebuilt the temple, and instead you've rebuilt your own lives. In this book, he gives no such description. And I think that's for a very particular reason, because Joel wants this story to tell us more about God than about ourselves, than about the Israelites. This story in Joel doesn't concern what the Israelites did wrong. It doesn't concern what we're doing wrong. It actually is more about the nature of who God is, okay? Which makes this a much more positive conversation than previous minor prophets' conversations, actually. Even though the language is more devastating, the conversation is actually a little bit happier because we get to talk about God this week and not about how bad people are, Okay? But here's the, here's the amazing thing, because God shows this moment really abundantly right after he describes this army, all, and right after he claims possession for them in verse 11, he immediately turns back in verse 12, and he says this, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and repents of evil. So he immediately, in the, in the conversation of devastation, okay, in the conversation of armies, in the conversation of destruction, of the land being totally destroyed, totally just eviscerated, I mean, the language is so strong, he then immediately comes back and says, but actually, even in this very moment, return to me with all of your heart. He says, even at this very edge of destruction, even at this very edge of the moment where we're saying, I see that everything's about to end. I see that everything's about to be over. I see that the sadness of the world is finally coming complete. God says, actually, even in this very moment, come back to me. Return to me. He says, return to me with an open heart, with all of yourself. Repent. Weep. Come with me with your broken spirit. He's not saying, wait until you're perfect and come back. Wait until you're, you're happy and joyful and come back. He says, no, come to me now with weeping, with wailing, with trouble on your mind and on your heart, he says, come back to me. God calls his people to repent in Joel chapter 2, and they do. And God says, okay, he, he takes this moment, and he, he offers them an alternative. He says, actually, the day of the Lord, it's near, but it's, it's near in the future. It's near, it's near long in the future. He says, while, it, while the events, the, the, the situation now almost prompted a moment for God to intervene and to finally judge the world, he says, now... Now that you have repented, now that you have returned to me, I will delay the destruction. He doesn't say, I won't do it. He says, I'll delay it. So the people returned to the Lord in chapter 3. They restored, God restored their land abundantly. All that was destroyed by the locusts, he returned to them. He says he returned every bit of their labor back to them. Every bit that was lost, he returned it back to them, and then he promises them in the future an overflow of spiritual blessing. What a wonderful promise. He says, I will return to you what was lost, and I will then give you an amazing spirit that will bless you and strengthen you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He uses the very verse that Peter will go on to preach on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, about the, the, the pouring out of the Spirit on the people, of all people, of all flesh. And in this moment, the story of Joel kind of comes fully around, right? Joel, he, he sees a moment. He sees a moment where Israel is, 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 at its, is at its bottom point, at a very rock bottom. They're at their worst moment. And instead of concerning ourselves with why they got there, what they did, or how they came back, instead we hear an amazing story of God who even at the very tip of destruction wants to say, actually, 
I want you with me. I don't want you destroyed. I don't want you hurt. I don't want you in pain. I want you with me. I don't want you perfect. I don't want you repaired. I want you with me. I think Joel really has four messages in it, and I think all of them concern our understanding of who God is. I think that all of them keep us focused on who God is in his nature, who he is in reference to his people, how good and gracious and merciful God really is. I think the beauty of God is in a story of Joel where we get some very descriptive, destructive, painful language. We actually really see God's beauty and, and grace. And the first, thing, the first thing that I think we should focus on here is that we shouldn't lose sight of God's purpose in the history of the world. I know this, you're, you're thinking, well, what, everything you just talked about, Thomas, what does that have to do with the history of the world? And I think it's very important that we realize this that all of history, any, any history book you want to open, okay, any moment in time, both past and present, and then in the future as well, that God has a purpose in the history of the world. He makes this very clear. He makes this very clear in chapter 2, verse 27. He says this. He says, You shall know that I am in the midst of the Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else, and my people shall never again be put to shame. He then mentions it again in chapter 3, verse 17. He says, The Lord... Or sorry. Uh, so you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. He says that his message is this, that everything he does is this, so that you may know that God is God. Joel's very name from the very beginning, he says, Yahweh is God. He, his very existence was, was preaching this, this very thing. And then God then, he, he repeats this conversation twice in the book. He says, I'm doing everything I'm doing so that you may know that I am God, so that you may see who I am. And I think it's very important that we realize this, that, that all the way from the small locust swarm, that actually is much bigger than we think it is, that destroys a, uh, uh, an area of crop in an area of the world that most of us have never been to uh, thousands of years ago, even, even through that moment, all the way to when, when, when Joel describes the very stars and the suns and the moon darkening and withdrawing from the shining and the heavens trembling, from the locust swarms to the very dissolving of the stars themselves, this imagery that we see from, from small problems to big cosmic issues, God's purpose in history is to be God in the eyes of all people of all of the world. That's his mission, that's his goal, that's what he wants, is for him to be known as God. God says it. He says, I am your God. I want you to know that I am in your midst. I'm not far and away and everywhere but here. He says, I am here with you now. He says, I want you to know this, that I am here through big and small problems, through problems that don't affect you and problems that are very close to you, through loss and heartbreak and joy and peace and amazing moments in life. He says, I am here in your midst. God's purpose in history is for us to know who he is. All of history is aligned for this very purpose. And every moment of time is aligned for this very purpose. But I think the second thing that God is, uh, is, is wanting us to learn in the book of Joel is something that's kind of a, a hard thing to, to learn, a, a hard pill to swallow, and it's that, this, that God will fight against us to bring us to repentance. The book of Joel tells a very interesting story of God waging war against his own people and for the explicit purpose for them to be motivated to repent to him. This is not always an easy conversation to have. We don't want to think of God like this. We want to think of God as, as just merciful and amazing, and he is that. But God also has a desire for you to be with him by all means. We see this throughout all of the Bible, a very strong and, 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 and pursu a pursuit of, uh, of, of repentance from all of his people. He sees, he sees a relationship that needs to be repaired, and he runs after it. We don't hear the stories of, of, of the 99, uh, of leaving the 99 and going after the one because we want to hear about the one. We hear that story because we want to know that God will pursue people. He will run after you. He will fight against your purpose for his purpose. But we have this promise that when our hearts wander from God, that he will fight against us. This is a good thing. This is an amazing thing that we should be thankful for. That when I, in all of my infinite stupidity, wander from God, when, when, when my wisdom fails, because it does daily, when, when I think I have the best idea, and it actually is very subpar, even in those moments, 
where I can be as far away as possible, God is, is fighting for me to get back to him, even if it means he's fighting against me, okay? Even if it means he's fighting against my purposes. Because God wants all of our heart all of the time. He doesn't want 70% of our heart 85% of the time, okay? He doesn't want 100% of our heart 25% of the time. He's not saying, hey, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, if you will give me all of you, then we'll be chill, okay? He's not cutting a deal. He's saying, I want all of you all of the time, and I will fight for that. He says this in, uh, in Amos 2, uh, verse 12. He says, yet even now, return to me with all your heart. Even now, even in your worst moments, even when I am, 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 am at my wit's end with you, even now, return to me with all of your heart. Don't return to me with a little bit. Return to me with all of it. I think the third thing that Joel wants us to think about, and, and this is one of the, one of the things that I, I, I hear a lot in the story that is very fruitful and edifying, I think, to the body, is that God is responsive to the genuine cries of his people. Something we all need to hear in tough times is that God is responsive to the genuine cries of his people. We see time and time again in Scripture, we, we, I, me and Paul, we joked about the book of Judges the other day. We said there's a cycle of people saying, God, I need you, and then saying, well, now that you're here, God, I don't need you. And then when they need God again, they're saying, God, I need you. And then when God's there, they're saying, I don't need you anymore. And we're like, those silly boys, what are they doing? They're, 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 they're being silly, and they're running away from God. They're seeing the amazing benefit of who God is, and then they're like, nah, I'm good. I'm blessed. Why do I need God? And yet, in that story, the one thing that we don't always read about, we, we read about the silliness and the unwise actions, but we don't always think about the fact that God, time and time again, in the moments of distress, he hears the cry and he responds to it. Even though Israel literally was reaping the harvest of their disobedience, which was nothing, they did nothing and they were getting nothing, even in that moment, God was blessing them, okay? Even in that moment, God was blessing them. Imagine farmers in the room, you said, this year, I don't want to plant corn. This year, I don't want to plant hay. This year, I don't want to plant soybeans. I'm going to do nothing. And at the end of the year, someone comes to your door and they say, here's money for all of your corn and soybeans. Have a good day. You're like, well, this is amazing. I've not done anything to deserve this. And yet, that is exactly how God responds time and time again, not just in Joel, but in the entirety of Scripture, is that he gives us something that we do not deserve, that we did not earn, that we couldn't earn. We just sang a song about it. All sufficient merit. What an amazing song. The sufficiency of God is something that is efficient in our lives that we cannot deserve. We can't. I didn't work for it. I couldn't work for it. I didn't earn it. I couldn't earn it. I didn't, I didn't fight for it because I couldn't fight for it because God is good, though I have it. God is responsive to the genuine cries of his people, and this is a good thing. This is an amazing thing. This is one of those things that we, we read and we talk about and we preach in this church, and it's what gives us hope to come back the next week. It gives us hope to continue to be with God another day. Even at our very worst moment, in our darkest day, it gives us moments to say, God does actually hear me. God does actually respond to me. God does actually see me, and even if I'm taking what I deserve, he sees me and gives me grace anyway. I think uh, one of the most amazing parts of this is that God demonstrates his faithfulness, okay? He demonstrates his promise to the people, okay? He's not demonstrating something that he's not demonstrated before. He's demonstrating something that is consistent with his character, his faithfulness to his people by his willingness to, give them, uh, by his willingness to forgive them. He's not demonstrating something new. This isn't a new factor of God that has come into the picture all of a sudden. This is something old that has been a part of who God is forever, and the most amazing part of this is that even at the very end, even at the time of judgment, he promises the same mercy that you could potentially get now and all the way at the very end. He says this in chapter 2, verse 32. It's very interesting. In the midst of Joel, we get this very strong apocalyptic message. He says this. He says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. What an amazing verse right? And it shall come to pass. It's not a, a maybe. It's not a, a, statistically, it probably will, right? He's saying it will happen that all of those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. I mean, this is amazing. This is what we want to hear. 
This is the message that we want other people to hear. This is why we, t- we preach. This is why we evangelize. This is why we're excited to open our Bible. This is why we're excited to pray to God and to, and to be with him and to have a relationship with him because he promises that even at the very end of time, right on the doorstep, on the very last moment, he says that even at that moment, all of those people who call on my name shall be saved. Amen. That's amazing. Joel is, 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 is giving us this word in the midst of, of a very tough moment. He's saying, actually, God is here, and he wants to, you to know that he hears you, that he hears you at the end, at the beginning. He hears you at any moment that you're crying out to him. He hears you. I think there's one, one more thing, a fourth thing that God's trying to tell us here, something that we should look for today, and that's this. He says to seek the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, okay? He gives us this message in, uh, in, verses, uh, in chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. You'll, you'll remember these verses because they're also in Acts chapter 2. He says that it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Peter uses this on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He preaches this very thing to the people. He says that this, this spirit is coming for you all. And then it does, right? It, at Pentecost, the Spirit then fills the room. It fills the people. We have this amazing moment that, it, that we wish to replicate in every church across the nation every day of, of people repenting and turning their lives to the God in this amazing display. And yet that moment is all the way back here in Joel, right? He's saying, for all time, I want you to do this. I want you to seek the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And now you're probably thinking, well, Thomas, that we're, we're thousands of years past Pentecost now, okay? That's already happened. And I'm saying I don't think it has finished. I think it's just the beginning. I think this is very clear because what Joel just described is not something that we see. What Joel just described is not something that we, we see every day. We don't see uh, sons and daughters prophesying. We don't see old men dreaming dreams. We don't see young men seeing visions. We see it sometimes, but we don't see it all the time. God promises an outpouring of his Holy Spirit to perfect the church. Is the church perfect? I say in jest, right? I ask a a question that I think we all know the answer to. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Not even close. We're getting there, hopefully. We're working towards it. We're praying that God would bless us to to get to that moment where we can be a perfect embodiment of who Jesus is. But until then, we seek the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on not just us, but our brothers and sisters in Christ on those who have yet to know God. We seek the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on people who, who are, are villains to God, who absolutely hate the concept of religion or hate the Bible. We pray that this Holy Spirit would come to them too. Joel isn't just talking about destruction in his time. He's talking about destruction at the end of time. And he warns us. He says that this will come. It's not just delayed for, for you again. It's not just going to be another moment where I'm close, but then it gets pushed back. It's going to happen. But when it does, we have the promise of knowing that God does save, that he will save. And so until then, we should seek the Holy Spirit in other people's lives. It's not, a, it's not something that is surprising. In fact, Jesus in the Great Commission, he doesn't tell us to be able to go and do uh, missions and to get people to be disciples of all nations because of our strength and our ability. He says, I will send a spirit that will empower you to do these things. So the spirit that we have is empowering us to make disciples of people who don't have the spirit so that we can seek the pouring out of the spirit on them as well. It's a system. It's an equation. My, me plus spirit equals adding the spirit to you. Okay. Now don't, don't quote me on my math, okay? I'm not good at it. Never claimed to be. But I want you to see this, that, that this, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit isn't something that happened and, and now we're past it. It's something that is happening and we should seek it to happen more and more and more. I uh, have a few questions before I'll uh, run away and let the worship team come back up. And I want you to really be thinking about these things. The first one is, how can you see God operating throughout your personal history? Because God has given us a very beautiful sight, okay? One that says that, He is operating throughout history for his will to be done, for him to be known as God. So I ask you to ponder this question this week. How can I see God operating throughout my personal history? I challenge you because I know that you'll see it. I know that you'll think back. You'll think back to this one moment where you were down and out and God came and fulfilled you. You'll think of a moment where you had an amazing fulfillment of joy in your life and you'll realize that it was actually, it was God who did that for you. 
Maybe you'll even think about one of the worst moments, a moment of loss, a moment of heartbreak, and you'll see that God comforted me through that moment. I ask you, how has God been operating throughout your personal history? Because I want you to be able to see that God's not just operating on, on the global history level. He's operating in your intimate history. He wants to be involved in your life, and I promise you that if you have been in love with God and you have, you've pursued a relationship with him, you've enjoyed life with him, that you'll be able to recall these moments where he's been operating behind the scenes or even very forwardly. I have another question now. What does it mean to you that God is always fighting for your heart? What does it mean to you that God is willing to fight through you to get to you? That God is willing to fight against your means to get to you? That God is willing to wage war against you so that you may be in relationship with him? What does it mean to you that? Uh, uh, what does it mean to you that God is willing to go to these great lengths to have a relationship with you? How does that affect you? How does that change how you view God? How does that change how you view yourself? Maybe, maybe you see yourself, you're saying, well, I'm on this tough pursuit of my own, my own will, my own path, my own uh, infinite uh, wisdom, right? And maybe I shouldn't be because God's going to fight against me either way to get me back to his path. Maybe I'm choosing the broad and easy path, and, God, and God's saying, oh yeah, well, I want you to be on the narrow one, and so I'm going to fight against you. Once again, welcome it, and I want you to know that this is a, a very changing view of who God is. It's a very impactful view of who God is. Last thing I want to ask you, and then I'll wrap up, is this. How does God's call for repentance shape our understanding of who God is, right? How does God's call for repentance of us shape our view of who He is, right? How does, how does, how does God, who has the ability to destroy uh, and, and, to, and to rid Himself of, of, of sin and, and evil, who has flooded the earth right? Who has, who has paved a way through, through God's enemies time and time again. How does that God, who, is, who does all these things and yet also has this amazing ability to repent and to seek relationship with people, how does that view change our view of who God is? How does the idea that God, at the end of the day, wants relationship over anything else, how does that view change how we see God? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're good to us, not because we're good, but because you're good. We thank you that you can commit amazing blessings upon our lives, not because we earned it, but because you just are so good, God. Lord, I thank you for the prophet Joel. I thank you for his message. I pray that his message be hopeful to our ears. It be, it be rejuvenating for our spirit, Lord, but I also pray that it be motivating us to go and seek relationship with others, to go seek uh, uh, the spreading of your message to other people, Lord. And, and God, I just, I pray right now that in this, in, this, in this room, in this building, in this house of God, Lord, that these people see you, God, as, as, as one who seeks mercy in relationship, one who seeks peace and love, one who seeks us. Even if we're imperfect, even if we're undeserving, even if we've fallen so short, Lord, that you still seek us. Lord, let us see that. Let us have our eyes on that, Lord. Let us be blessed by that. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.
Almighty fortress is our God, our bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth speak to work us woe. His craft and power are great and onward cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would not Ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, the Lord of hosts, His name, the age you wage the same, and He must win the battle. And though this world with devils should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath will his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. Himself pursues you, that He chases after you, that He seeks a relationship with you at all costs. May you know that His Spirit resides in you, strengthens you, and encourages you, and is with you always to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, go in peace.